Hello, uh, am I audible? Hello. Perfect, perfect. Yes, great. Okay, uh, thank you, Adriana, um, for the introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in what, whatever part of the world. Uh, I'm going to steal, steal a line from uh, one of the people I follow, and that is that you could have been anywhere, uh, any part of the world right now, but you chose to be here. So I appreciate that really, really. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, welcome to my talk on uh, building Flipkart advertising a journey. Um, this is a case study, theoretically put, but um, it is about, as I said, it's a journey. So we'll be discussing about what we were trying to build, why we were trying to build, um, the thought process behind the decision making, and why did we take certain decisions, and why did we did not do certain ways. And um, so, yeah, without further ado, let's start off with it. So, um, next slide, please. So who am I? Uh, I'm Avinash. I am an engineering manager at uh, Flipkart at Tech, and I lead the UI team there. And uh, I've been here in this team for around like three years now, three plus years. And before that, I was, again, I was still at Flipkart, but I was in a different team. And I was leading the uh, UI team at the Flipkart Lite PWA. Flipkart Lite PWA was the first large scale e-commerce PWA that we built in collaboration with the Chrome team back then in 2016, 2017. And, uh, and here I am today, again, discussing my journey on building another such PWA at Flipkart itself. Next slide. So um, a little bit of history on Flip, what Flipkart advertising is or what Flipkart advertising means. So um, Flipkart advertising has existed since 2019, and it was predominantly a desktop application. And uh, with time, we saw the adoption and the growth and usage, and many people wanted to use it beyond their uh, work time, or let's say someone's in a taxi going back home and would want to see how things are operating. And uh, that gave us that momentum and the uh, cue uh, to start building uh, Flipkart advertising for different form factors. And that is how the journey for building the PWA started. Next slide, please. So, uh, before we get into the PWA, it is important that we understand the nature of the work. What exactly do we do or what exactly is the application do? Um, it is an application catered to advertisers and uh, basically it helps them create advertising campaigns. It helps them onboard onto the application, of course, and help them run campaigns. Um, but technically speaking, uh, it is it is a very, very large um, it's a very uh, large application. It has a lot of complex workflows. We have multi step. Um, uh, campaign creation or workflow or uh, campaign creation or onboarding workflows. Um, we deal with a lot of amount of data that we have to fetch on the client. Um, we do some cool stuff as well. We work a lot with Canvas. We work a lot with uh, web workers for multi-threading. We work a lot with off-screen Canvas for generating uh, creatives or image creatives uh, previews. Um, we'll do a little bit of Wasm here and there as well. Um, so, yes, it's a quite a large as well as a complicated application, but at the, at the heart, at the heart of Flipkart advertising, there are basically 3 important things um, that it actually runs on. Um, so, uh, we have been a huge proponent. Flipkart has been a huge proponent of uh, server driven UI back since 2016, 2017, and as a matter of fact, and uh, it has still continued to be a part of Flipkart advertising as well. Um, because we have a, a very complicated workflow and uh, we need to do run a lot of uh, validations and do a lot of check before the data is submitted to the server. Um, we basically use um, state machines for modeling our uh, workflows. And of course, we have a rule engine that basically takes declarative or imperative rules that you can define and that can execute at the particular point in time. For example, you would want to put in some validation on your budget checks or something like that. Uh, those are all defined as, um, as uh, declarative JSON objects. Those rules are implemented as JSON objects and that can be executed by a rule engine within the state machines. Um, so this is basically how the overall, uh, you know, the architecture of the application stands. Uh, it is also important for us to note that the entities and the data that are modeled in uh, Flipkart ads is quite, quite hierarchical. Uh, if anyone has worked in the ad space might know that you might have an entity called a campaign, which can have an one is to end mapping for ad groups, which is another entity. And within each ad group, you can have again one, one is to end mapping of another entity called ads. So we have hierarchical 
uh, data structures that are modeled, at least in this ad space. Um, uh, so that also gave us back when we were starting off with the desktop application uh, to decide the right data structure for modeling uh, this, this communication between client and server as to how to fetch um, efficiently such um, uh, hierarchical structure. And that is where beyond, beyond this, as well as uh, dependent upon other factors as well, we went with GraphQL and we'll be discussing about GraphQL for some point uh, at some point in time in the presentation as well. So this is a little bit of a background of what Flipkart advertising has been till now. And uh, the idea here is that we will be uh, looking into how such things were ported onto the PW as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you a very, um, uh, like, uh, like a very 60,000 feet view of, from the top what it looks like. And uh, uh, it's a very simple diagram where it says that you have a lot of clients on the right um, uh, let's say it could be mobile or it could be desktop, but they all talk to a central gateway layer. Uh, this gateway layer does a lot of things for us, um, other than the fact that it's an aggregator layer as well, because we have GraphQL in between. Uh, so it's going to talk a lot to other services, collate the data, process the data, and then send it back to the client. Let's say it would be mobile or desktop. Um, it also does other important things for us, for example, um, authentication, authorization, um, all those things as well. So this is this is roughly what the important, you know, like the how the how the overall overall 60,000 feet view architecture uh, visually looks like. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what's important to take away from that particular slide is that on the right, when we saw that each of them were clients, uh, so each of those implementations are actually hosted as a separate uh, in independent micro front end, and they all are communicating with the same language to a central gateway layer, which does all of the things that I mentioned, which is data aggregation, which is authentication, which is authorization, uh, and all those things. Um, uh, now that we are talking about PWAs, I can actually start to get into the realm of it. Um, we have a standard uh, shell content architecture. It has been proven. It has been proven to work. It is a it's a, it's a good model for uh, for implementing a PWA. We have a shell content architecture. We even have a shell content architecture for the desktop application as well. Um, and because of the heart of uh, Flipkart advertising is is the idea of authentication authorization, it is very paramount for us that. Uh, we ensure that pages which are not accessible to a particular user should not be loaded at all, um, which means that we handle our all redirects and everything server side rather than client side. Um, so, so SSR also helps uh, for rendering the shell. So when we do render those shells, we ensure that the right, the URLs that are actually accessible to you are loaded and only beyond then the APIs are also access control within them. Uh, now imagine as I'm assuming, let's say that the user is allowed to access a particular page. Uh, there are two level of access controls that we implement. Um, one at a route level, which basically says that whether, hey, this URL is accessible to you or not. Um, this is, uh, the, the, our application is built in uh, React, um, but uh, I'm just uh, taking a, uh, an abstract construct here. Like if you could define all your routes and you could say that the path for the particular route and the component to render against that route, um, we define also define the roles who are supposed to access your particular routes. Um, and once, let's say, this uh, check passes and this route is supposed to be rendered for you, we do not stop there uh, because we also have the second level of access control that is implemented for all the APIs that are being made by that particular page. So um, in that case, because our APIs are implemented in GraphQL, uh, we have the idea of um, um, query and mutations for item potent and non item potent operations, uh, let's say in the rest world. So uh, we could define a get call or a query, and we could say that the name of the operation is called get campaigns and it returns an array of campaigns. But the point is that this API is access controlled. Uh, and uh, only certain roles are allowed to make this particular call, which is role A, role B, or role C in this particular matter. So this is how uh, we have been implementing and ensuring that access control is put in place for all of our, uh, or whether it is navigational requests or whether it is API requests. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, it's also at, uh, at this point, um, it's also important for us to understand that uh, we first built the desktop application and now we are building the PWA. Um, we are uh, eventually, of course, utilizing a lot of our existing infrastructure. Uh, if you remember the, the diagram that we saw two slides back, 
uh, we are mostly implementing, we are mostly worked on the implementing the micro front end UI for the PWA while all the server side infrastructure was just used out of the box. Um, given that we had GraphQL in place, it also helped us in defining what our queries might look like where the desktop application could ask for larger amount of data and uh, the client or let's say mobile client could ask less amount of data depending upon who they are. And uh, because GraphQL is flexible at such point in time, so actually that that was basically one of the decisions that we had to take back in 20, 2019 uh, as to what data structure should be used uh, to model um, uh, you know such hierarchical data, you know hierarchical entities, uh, keeping such use cases uh, in mind. Um, but once we started building this uh, micro frontend for the PWA, we had a couple of very very important things to focus on. Uh, we had to ask ourselves, what do we want? for the user uh, to experience when we build this application. Now, what exactly is that we wish the user would uh, need? And uh, there are a couple of very important things. And the first one is, of course, that um, uh, it has to be offline first. Now, technically, it's 2022. No one uses anything truly offline. Uh, what we def essentially mean that we are resilient to internet or network, network conditions or network instabilities where your application should not break in case there is a, there is a you know, uh, net network issue that is being faced by a user. Um, that has been quite, quite, uh, in the last couple of years, that has been quite a good penetration of 4G in India after Reliance Geo came into picture. Um, so, uh, to be frank, um, bandwidths in India have increased over time, um, but devices are still, you know, like, I mean, if I, if, if I, if I do remember that uh, uh, till 2020 to 2021, 70% of the smartphones that were sold in India, 70% of those smartphone sales were actually still contributed by the budget phones. Um, so the point to take away here is that um, uh, we have moved from the idea of, you know, uh, 2G and all those things being a, being a contributing bandwidth to the user base that we have uh, after Reliance Geo has come in. So that has given us a little bit of breathing space to build and give better experience to the user. Uh, but at the same time, uh, network instabilities are different. So that can happen even if you are in a 4G or in a potential in a 5G connectivity. So resilience uh, to internet connectivity is definitely paramount. Um, the second thing is that we really, really want to focus and optimize on our repeat visit. We want people to come back. We want people to come back and start using their applications um, the way we intended them to do. And the third thing, of course, is it's a PWA and uh, we want the user to feel no less uh, just because they do not have a native app in their in their hand, we wanted to give them the best possible experience that they might have had if they had a native app installed. Uh, next slide, please. So, with that in mind, um, I'm going to just put you right now where we stand um, when it comes to the PWA. Um, so, uh, this is this is the this is the performance sheet of my team that the work that I put in, and something that we are really really particular about. Um, something that is very important to us to follow those uh, yardsticks that we had sent that we had just set and discussed about. Right now, as of now, we have uh, we have a total JavaScript footprint of 200 KB compressed, um, and uh, the performance numbers are basically in front of you. Uh, we have some work to do, but uh, at this point, I would say that it is satisfactory. Uh, it's good enough. So this is where we are as 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 we are starting with our journey for the PWA. Next slide, please. So um, just to recap on to what exactly our major intent was, um, uh, we have uh, Flipkart always has 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 always operated with two modo, two tenets, and the first one is that anything and everything for the user, and second thing is instrument as much as possible and then decide. Um, we are going to have this as one of the one of the talismans uh, of the upcoming slides where um, we want to take a decision not because. It's there, not because five people talked about it, but did we take a decision because I have instrumented it. I have found that it is actually important for my users and thus we are going to put it or we are going to use it. Next slide, please. So let's start off uh, with uh, the first tenet that we're discussing about, which is network resilience. Um, so offline first. Now, uh, the way this basically implements is that um, uh, we are pretty, pretty aggressive when it comes to caching, whether it is static resources or dynamic resources, as in API data or everything. Um, at the same time, we also use a small, a slightly modified version of the stale while revalidate strategy. We'll discuss about it. Um, combined with this, basically how we have the, this basically combination 
combination of these two basically provides us that uh, aggressive, um, um, you know, like the offline first experience that we can actually give to our users. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does slightly modified sale while revalidate mean? Um, now, this is a shameless plug, uh, you know, plugin of, uh, of Jake's uh, amazing um, biblical uh, um, article that he wrote quite some, back, quite some time back on the, on the uh, cookbook, the cookbook, offline cookbook for uh, all the recipes for our uh, strategies for PWAs. Um, just for a moment, just forget about the, the arrow that reads number six. Um, everything else is basically standard stale while revalidate where a page actually makes a network call. You have a service worker in place that intercepts us and that intercepts the request. Um, it is going to uh, read from the cache and if it, if it finds it, of course, it's going to give you back. Um, that is what where the uh, row uh, arrow number three completes the loop. Uh, but it is because it's still going to revalidate it, so it is going to go ahead, make a network request for the same uh, endpoint, um, get it and put it into the cache. Uh, the only difference for us is that uh, we don't stop there. Uh, we just go ahead and decide that, you know what, we might have gotten newer data and that it is important for us to let the user know that this, there is new data available. So we kind of go ahead and just make one more communication between the service worker thread and the main, main, and the main thread. And that is exactly what arrow number six is, uh, where it basically takes the newer data, puts it into the cache, and then also communicates to the user that, hey, newer data is available, what would you like to do? Um, now, I come from the days where I have hand coded service workers and I've also uh, moved on and we have used very, very popular library those days, which is SW Toolbox. Um, these have been a really great time savers for us because you do not have to hand code a lot of things. And, uh, but the service worker SW Toolbox still had its own limitations and uh, it, there was, it was still to some extent uh, a bit imperative as well. Um, but it's 2022, we had all the luxury of starting with all the best possible technology that we can think of. And that's exactly, uh, where we, where we had the, where we had the choice to actually put in the best possible tooling to improve the DX as well. So next slide, please. And that's exactly where a tool like Workbox comes into picture. And of course, this is not, this is not a talk about Workbox, but it's just about the fact that of course, yes, um, Workbox has been a great. Um, you know, uh, tool addition to our entire DX um, toolkit. Um, we have been using it for multitude of uh, multitude of uh, reasons. But today we will be discussing about two particular things uh, uh, that has been really really important for us. Next slide, please. And uh, that is uh, using the workbox strategies and uh, plugins. Um, so strategies, of course, like you know, the, it's, it's basically your your using any preset uh, recipes for your. Uh, uh, interception of the requests, whether you would want to, you know, respond as a cash first as a strategy or a network for strategy. It also allows you to define your own custom strategies. I mean, just to say that it's, it's not that SW Toolbox didn't allow that. It, it, that it did. It, it, Workbox is a little bit more polished uh, when it comes to, you know, such constructs. Um, so, yeah, so strategies allow you to define how you want the interception uh, to interception workflow to look like you have complete control over it. And, uh, the other thing is plugins, uh, plugins are not exactly, uh, you know, like they are, they are not like strategies. They are not as powerful as strategies, but they do provide a lot of help, uh, by giving you hooks at particular events or important events that might happen during. Uh, a particular uh, strategy work, you know, workflow. For example, let's say if something if, if something was read from the cache, or let's say something wasn't read from the cache. These are some important milestone points that you might be interested in, and uh, that is basically where you would mind you might want to plug in some code and execute them. So that is exactly what the purpose of plugins are. So we have been using mostly, uh, you know, like our own custom strategies because. Um, we had to make a small change on slightly modified version of um, the stale while revalidated strategy. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we had to write our own custom strategy and we'll discuss about that why. Um, but yeah, we have what we have been using is a combination of both strategies as well as plugins. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what's very important for us to understand is that um, we are using um, this PWA with a standard GraphQL endpoint because we said that we're going to 100% rely on the server side infrastructure. Um, so it has its own challenges to solve uh, uh, and we'll discuss about those challenges in a bit. But yes, I think, um, I mean, what's going to be interesting is like basically how we integrated our PWA with the GraphQL endpoint. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so uh, what's the most important thing that we had faced when we were implementing a, a, a client on the uh, on on the desktop application when it was integrating with the same uh, GraphQL endpoint? Um, the first important thing was that we used we use Apollo as an implementation for uh, the GraphQL uh, uh, you know APIs, and uh, Apollo Server is it's, it's a tremendous implementation for it, and we use Apollo Client as well uh, for the UI, and it's a quite a bloated library. Uh, it, it's 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 very powerful. It has a lot of features. But it is quite bloated as well. It's a very large library to speak of, and uh, when we started with uh, with with the PWA, as if you remember, um, you know, like anything and everything for the user and making things faster is quite quite important. Uh, we had to come out of our comfort zone uh, when it came to deciding how we can implement a good feature, but at the same time we can keep our bundle sizes in check. The bloat has to be less so that the pages actually load faster. Um, so reducing on the client side bundle size has been really, really important that we have worked on. Um, keeping the entire JavaScript footprint to 200 KB uh, compressed has been a challenge for us. And uh, to do that, exactly, we had to, do, we had to take certain uh, hard decisions. Uh, the first one was to actually go ahead and get rid of any such GraphQL client that we might have had. Um, uh, to use nothing on the client and just use very simple vanilla implementations for it. Um, now we could say you know like like should we do it or not it it depends it depends on what exactly are your uh, are your uh, you know like uh, uh, what exactly are the parameters that you're trying to uh, weigh your pwa on and one of the important things that we have seen is that like loading the application faster uh, and displaying the things right away has been the most important thing that we have really wanted for our users to be. And hence, we were okay with this decision. And of course, it has its own it has its own cost. We might we have had to implement certain things to make this work, of course. And we'll be discussing about it. Um, so yeah, we started off with saying no to any any library. For that matter, to be to be to be frank, uh, we have a very strict policy of adding any external dependency to our code base unless something it's really really uh, so niche that it it. it we have no other choice than to put that put that library into our code base, but uh, but we have a very strict policy of adding any external dependency, and we have just started off with uh, the client side implementation for the uh, for the GraphQL endpoints. So no libraries, vanilla implementations, and uh, so that takes away a lot of the bloat that we were discussing about. But um, we know that GraphQL requests are also quite heavy because they have to give they have to you know load up a lot of. Uh, the, the payloads are relatively large because they also have to send that entire request structure, right? I mean, because it's a graph, you are requesting to query a graph, so you have to give what that graph looks like, um, and that is basically one of the one of the important reasons that why by default GraphQL endpoints are not non-item potent. For example, things like uh, post requests. Um, so to avoid that and to improve upon the network bandwidth usage of our users. Uh, what we decided that we're going to trim down on what exactly are these uh, you know payloads that you're wanting to send so we agreed upon the fact that we will send the payload against a request that is needed for example if you want to get the campaign data for a particular id of course you have to send the campaign id as a payload but what you want in return um, that entire graph structure is something that we decided that we will get away with and the way we implemented that is by using uh, hashed queries and basically hashed queries are basically named queries where instead of giving that entire graph structure that you want to query you give a hash of that and on the server side we determine what exactly is that structure that you want uh, we get the data that you want wanted back and then we basically give you back so uh, that is roughly basically how the entire things came into picture that with the decision started off with reducing the bloat uh, it went on to the fact that okay we cannot use any uh, external library for that but then uh, also, uh, to implement or help on the network bandwidth usage of the user, we wanted to cut down or curtail on the request payloads as well, and that is where we ended up using or implementing hashed queries. Uh, next slide, please. Now is the important point. Uh, we were just discussing about the fact that uh, GraphQL requests by default, usually, usually they are non-item potent in nature, and we are discussing about all of this in the context of a PWA and we were saying that uh, loading the page faster was more important than anything, which means that network resilience and offline first was all really, really important to us. Uh, the problem is that uh, caches cannot just put in any non iron request response pair. Um, so that was again one of the challenges that we had to solve where we had to define a way of uh, finding out that there is an incoming post request 
from the client, from the application, but the service worker has to intercept that, do something on it, um, make the request as it is to the server. The server still in, the server still accepts a post request because we're still utilizing the infrastructure that we have built till now. The only problem is that I cannot cache this request as such in the caches um, API. Uh, so what we had to do was we basically put a small converter in the service worker that that actually does this uh, you know transformation for every fresh request that it gets uh, potentially for most of the API calls. So what it does is that it takes the request. So you the application makes a request, the service worker intercepts the request. Now it takes the request, it takes the payload for it, but it generates a, a unique identifier for it. Uh, and uh, we basically use the crypto module and we basically generate a unique identifier against the entire payload. And that becomes the cacheable entity against which the response is going to be cached. So this is how we basically do a P P to G like a post to get conversion kind of a kind of a kind of transformation here, which takes a post request converts into a get request by generating a unique identifier for the payload and uh, then caches uh, the response incoming response from the network against that unique identifier. So that is how we were able to solve the problem of uh, reducing the payloads by using uh, named requests or hashed queries and also uh, ensuring that a service worker is actually able to uh, uh, able to uh, cache uh, non id reported requests as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, just to understand, um, this is a sample you know, custom strategy. Um, uh, this is important for us to understand that uh, to, to, to some extent, I would say all of this um, would have been done away with if caches was, uh, you know, caches API allowed us to um, cache non item potent requests. And uh, we could have just used a standard stale while revalidate uh, strategy that comes as a preset in Workbox. And we could have just implemented a small plugin on top of it, which said that, okay, if the cache automatically gets updated, please communicate it to the main thread that the cache has updated. That is exactly the last step that we do. That if your cache has been updated, please communicate to the main thread that the cache has updated with some newer data. The issue was the fact that we had to do all of this transformation in between for the P2G, which is supposed to get conversion and generating that unique identifier. And that is the reason that we were not able to use the standard stale while revalidate strategy. And hence we had to implement our own custom strategy. The code in, in front of you is just a sample pseudocode implementation for it, where you get the, you get the, uh, you check if the response is there in the cache and, uh, uh, yeah, then you go ahead and you you get the body of the payload. You generate a unique identifier that uses uh, in the crypto module, uh, which is already built in, and, uh, and then of course you either return that or the network response with whatever whatever it is. And uh, after that, now this gives us that 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 entire uh, control uh, whether that after the caches have been updated, we can still go ahead and do a post message to all the all the controlled clients of a particular service worker. So that is how the entire um, um, strategy was implemented for for making a network call to a GraphQL endpoint, ensuring that your network payloads are not at large, but at the same time you are able to cache non non item important requests made by the client. Next next slide, please. Um, so, uh, again, going back to the second tenet, um, instrument as much as possible and then decide what you want. Uh, so it's also important for us to understand what we are doing, how is it faring in the real world. So, uh, monitoring is very, very important. It should be for anyone. Um, and that is where the plugin system has been really important to us, where you could actually um, build a plugin, which is a reporting plugin, and that will decide things like uh, whether there was a cash miss or not, whether there was a cash hit or not. Um, that is basically what we are reading around, you know, like what is the, usually the cash read times. We are also looking into what are the cash read times for each of the devices, because I still, we, we just discussed that 70% of the devices still sold in India falls into the budget category. So um, the, the, the cash read times are important to us. Uh, and also the number of times we have a cash miss, that's also important. So uh, these numbers actually, help us in deciding and understanding whether we should be more aggressive or less aggressive, whether things are working fine or not. Um, th that basically helps us in deciding what decisions to make in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, one important, uh, you know, again, a uh, very handy plugin that I would say that uh, that's worth mentioning is, um, I, I, as we all know that, you know, cache eviction is one of the most important computer science problems that we have. And um, no, no different for the service worker caches either. Um, I, I, I do remember having implemented a, a expression uh, you know, logic in uh, SW toolbox because it did not have an, an already implemented one. Uh, but it is worth mentioning here that you have a very, very handy preset plugin that comes with Workbox 
that gives you the control over the number of entries and the time that you wish to um, keep those entries in time. It's, it's, it's the only thing is that um, the, the, the expiration happens post the response has been sent back. So you might be one step stale when it comes to the expiration, but still, it's still, it's, it's really great because it takes away so much of verbosity, it takes away so much of the imperative implementation and a lot of your service worker starts to look like a webpack the declarative plugin these days, unless you were writing, the, you know, a lot of custom or imperative or custom uh, strategies. Uh, so that is, I think one of the, that in that way, I personally feel that uh, Workbox has been a great addition to their overall toolkit um, because it also it helps bringing on board the developers easily as well to start writing you know uh, such such code which are so powerful uh, which can do so many things uh, for the developer without getting into the details of it right so that's that's how I feel that Workbox has really contributed to the overall uh, DX part for for the team. Next slide, please. So uh, right now what I'm going to show you uh, is a simple demo. Uh, which is, which basically talks about everything that we talk, you know, like, uh, we are, you know, like we discussed right now, uh, we can play the video. Um, yeah, it's basically talking to you about uh, the fact that uh, we are a uh, cash first. So this is what the application looks like. It is very um, uh, visual in nature. It is basically a brand insights uh, application, which shows you the, um, the insights for a particular brand against a category against other other competitors. And um, um, this is very data driven. Uh, and what it's very important for us is that we provide these uh, uh, provide these experiences faster. What you are seeing is, of course, an optimized repeat visit because that is what was important for us. So if you see the way these pages are loading faster for every navigation, because we have a cache first, and we are very very aggressive when it comes to um, you know caching uh, this data, whether it is static or dynamic. So uh, this is this is this is basically what the outcome of uh, all the points that we just discussed in the last 10, 15 minutes. So, yeah, so this is this is more or less what the application looks like right now. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, so the next thing that is also important for us is to understand is that um, we said that we made a small uh, change to the stale while we validate strategy. And we said that uh, in the end, if the cache is updated with newer data, uh, we have to communicate that to the main thread that the, the, the cache is updated and you might have new data. But the, how does the application react to it? Uh, it's a small it's a small thing, but it is important because user experience is very paramount to us. Now, what happens here is that um, your, your data might have changed. Um, but the way the data might have changed is different and hence the way the application should react to that should also be different. Uh, our applications are versioned. Uh, it's a SEMVR version and uh, it depends upon what version of the application changed. If the change is very minor, we might choose a simpler, we might choose a simpler um, um, way to communicate that to the user. It could be a toast message that says that, you know, the application has uh, complete, you know, your application has updated. You might want to refresh to see the latest data. But if the changes are larger or they are the major, then of course we have a different UX implementation for that. But let's say it comes up with a blocking dialogue, which says that, hey, you have to refresh. Otherwise, we will not be allowing you to use because the changes have been larger or the changes have been major. So that is how we have also looked into how we wanted our, our applications to react to changes in the version in the version of the application. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so the, the next the next part of this uh, talk is going to focus a little bit on um, experiences and user experiences and how we want to talk particularly about um, uh, how do we want to ensure that the, the 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 page loading becomes faster for the user and how we are able to provide them a uh, very uh, app like feeling and app like experiences and all of that that is basically what's going to be the focus for the next uh, this particular upcoming section uh, next slide please um so the important thing for us is that uh, we have many pages in the application most of the applications do and it is important that uh, while the user is, uh, you, you know, currently, you know, surfing on the current page, it might be great uh, if we could start looking at the potential next set of pages so that the page to page navigations are also important. It's, it's uh, the point to take away from here is that performance is not just limited to your load time performance, which is limited to, let's say, things like your web vitals. Um, that, that, that's, that's important. That's great to, you know, have a good monitoring of your web vitals, but um, that is not where the user's journey starts the user journey starts after the application load so it is also equally important that we focus on the in-app 
experience or the session experience that we are providing to the user, which means that how does your scroll look like? How does your animations look like? How do your page to page navigations look like? So uh, that is where you also wanted to ensure that page to page navigations are also equally, um, uh, you know, faster and smoother uh, applications. These days are usually route chunks. So we have chunks for each route or I mean, it depends upon how your chunking strategy is. Um, but yeah, I think what we do is that we actually maintain a DAG, a directed acyclic graph that given a page, we actually know what are the next potential um, outgoing edges. Usually this number can be, you know, something derived from, let's say, Google Analytics, where you can see what the user funnel is usually like. Uh, so we can, we maintain this DAG and uh, this DAG is basically passed on to the client and that basically allows it to put a prefetch link for each of these outgoing chunks that the user might end up with. So while the user is actually surfing on the current page, the browser ensures that the lower priority is able to go ahead and fetch the next set of pages that the user can potentially land on. So that ensures that by the time that user has made her mind to move on to the next page, those pages have already been downloaded and put into the HTTP cache, as well as the service worker cache. <coughs> next, next slide, please. Um, the next one is again, um, something uh, that's quite quite uh, um, you know like related in the realm of the pws and that is the app install um app install has seen so much of work app install has seen so much of investment across uh, since its birth and, uh, uh, and, and, and and that is still a battle that we have been fighting with the user as the what is the best possible way to communicate that uh, what exactly the idea of installing a web application mean uh, is it still bookmarking? Is it going to do something else? Um, but um, we are not discussing about what exactly uh, app install as an API does, but more than that, what we are discussing is that having that empathy for the user that when are we going to do this? When are we going to do so? What we all know that Chrome or most of the browser that supports the, the app install, they run a heuristic which says that okay, there are certain things that have to there has to be service worker, there has to be cache, there's a manifest, and all of that. Um, and once these heuristics match, the browsers tell that hey, you know what, we are ready to show this uh, uh, this uh, installation banner. Um, but but what what's important is that you really want the user to to go ahead and interact with it. Uh, we just have to be a bit more frugal as to uh, when we decide that this is the right time to go ahead and show this particular app install banner to the user, and that is what we are going to discuss about. Um, so uh, right away showing uh, uh, showing the installation banner, I think is one of the um, weaker implementations of how most of the applications do and something that we do not encourage. Uh, I think it is better that we find the right place and the right time to show this particular installation banner to the user. Uh, coming from the flipkart.com uh, experience, um, that right time was something uh, that we decided that when the user actually per completes a purchase, that is the right time that the user has spent enough time on the application that it is it it, it seems to be a decent a decent uh, timestamp to now ask the user hey you made a purchase you did all of that would you be interested to install the application uh, very similarly we had to do a strategy here where we had to decide like what exactly is the right time to do that um the way we basically do that from an API perspective is that we have an uh, before install prompt and uh, uh, we just do a prevent default so that that browser does not go ahead and just show the uh, the the pop up, uh, but install, we just basically instead we just store it and use it when the right time happens. Um, but it is important for us to understand what the right time is and Flipkart ads was a bit tricky in that matter. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we have um, uh, we have many roles in Flipkart ads or in particular, let's say any any such application that might have had uh, different roles and different access uh, allowed for each of the roles. Um, but in terms of in, in the context of Flipkart ads, we have so many roles. For example, we have an admin role, we have a campaign manager, we have business analysts, we have finance managers and so on and so forth. I just it, it, the list is pretty large. The, the important thing for us to understand that each of these roles have different responsibilities in the application that they can do. For example, the finance manager may be only one may only be act, given access to deal with the wallet with the amount of money in the account, while a business analyst may be allowed only to see the reports for the campaigns that have run, uh, while the campaign manager would be allowed to maybe, let's say, look at the reports, but as well as the same time, they will be allowed to create and edit campaigns as well. Uh, while admins, you know, it just uh, this is as an umbrella road that can do everything. Um, so defining the right moment for each of these roles is very, very important. 
So as we just discussed, like, you know, like, for example, let's take an example of a campaign manager. A campaign manager can mostly they do what they do is they come they create and edit campaigns. So for them, maybe once they create a campaign, that could be a right time when we show the installation banner. While let's say a, a finance manager, for that matter, when they're looking at wallet and when they're topping up some money into the wallet, maybe that could be the right time. The point I'm trying to make is that when we are saying that we want to give a good experience to the user, um, it is not just about what APIs are available. We always had the API for showing the, the installation banner. The, the, the point to understand here is that we need to also be empathetic to the user to ensure that we are doing this not to disturb the user's journey, but to ensure that they are going to have a good experience when they come back the next time. So that is why the, the important point to take away from here is the fact that we need to find the right time when we want to show the installation banner. Next slide, please. Um, so here is a small example of the, how the richer install um, app banner looks like. And of course, uh, this is how mostly uh, we can play the video. We can play the video. And uh, this is roughly, uh, you know, like how uh, most of the, this is the native bottom sheet implementation of the uh, installation banner uh, um, currently that we have. Uh, and uh, if you could play the video again. Um, so what we see here is that we have a lot of screenshot that you can put. This looks very similar to how the Play Store installation banners look like, uh, where they have so much of information that we can put. So now, given that we have the, the UI and the UX, which is very uh, similar to how the native applications look like, the point to take away is that we need to ensure that we are doing it right at the right time so that it does not disturb the current session of the user. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, let's talk about navigation preload because every 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 PWA talks about PWA talk gives you know some some insight into navigation preload. Um, so by the way, to start off with, we do not use navigation preload, um, but I still wanted to go ahead and uh, talk about it because I want to. So uh, so let's talk a little bit about navigation preload. Next slide, please. So we 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 know what uh, as navigation preload is. Um, uh, it's basically the idea that um, service workers they are not just uh, you know like immortal. They die because the operating system decides that they are no longer needed. And uh, whenever there is a network request or whenever there is a push notification or something, then the operating system has, has to the operating system has to wake it up. And uh, now if there is a request that is pending on the network. Um, it has to be blocked till that waking up operation happens. Now, when the service worker wakes up, then it is able to take that request and execute it. Um, that is exactly what we are seeing here is that there is a service worker asleep latency that you have to that you have to handle or they have to pay the cost for if you are interested in uh, you know making that request to the network because there is a navigation uh, latency for it. Uh, what preload basically does is that you it allows you to navigate or bypass this yellow uh, yellow block at the end uh, by saying that even if the service worker is asleep you might want to not stop me uh, from going to the network while you are you know awaking the the uh, service worker so both things can go hand in hand uh, next slide please uh, so that is basically what it might look like that your service worker waking up or booting up and the network request go in tandem they go hand in hand um, so uh, now, why are we discussing about it? Now, it, we, the, the thing is important for us to understand that is that we don't do navigation preloads. Why? Because our shells are always cached. We wanted to really, really give that network resilient experience where we wanted everything to load faster. So that was one of the reasons that we had decided that our shells should also be cached. Now, it has its own repercussions and we have to solve for that repercussion as well. But the idea here is that the moment the user taps on the uh, on the on the icon or on the, or, or just any, or, uh, or uh, you know enters the URL in the URL bar, we wanted the response to be faster and not just the shell. We wanted to that we wanted to ensure that if I have the data associated with it, then the shell and the content both should load faster. Um, so that is exactly the reason where we do not have a navigation latency because we do not have a dependency on navigations because our shells are cached, right? So if we go to the next slide, um, so this is exactly what we were discussing that we have 100% cached shells. We do not depend on the network mostly for the mostly for the shells. Um, but then there are some issues that we had to solve, um, you know, you know, depending upon that. But the, but the, but the important thing here is that we are quite quite open to this idea. As I said, 
experiment and instrument everything and only decide whether it is worth implementing it. So this is exactly where we are right now. We are in the experimenting phase. We are in the instrumenting and measuring phase. Um, so one of the most important things that for us to understand is that this boot up time, how long is it? We don't know. There is no number around it. It all depends on the user's device. And that is exactly how why I feel that front end engineers job is so tough because you have infinite run times our run times are actually the devices of the user which are infinite in number we cannot put an we cannot just put a state or a stat on the on the on the user's device it could be any device it could it could be performing at any levels we do not even know what the duress level of a user device is so at this point the only thing that we have is that the boot up time of a service worker depends upon the user's device and the condition of the user's device so Let's measure that. Let's measure to find out that whether it is worth implementing uh, navigation payload. So uh, next slide, please. So the way we would implement uh, implement or it's it's quite easy to actually you know measure how long does your service worker boot some time actually take. And uh, we, uh, so the, uh, the the navigator's performance API it's actually quite quite helpful in this. So basically um, you get the entry for the navigation request that you're making, and uh, uh, basically you have two two keys in that entry, and one is called the worker start, and the other is the request start. Worker start is basically the point at which the service worker has been, you know, like it has been booted up and request start is basically where uh, it is the timestamp where the fetch request was handled. So now this is basically the difference. Uh, the difference between these two basically tells you that, okay, one time is when the service working being asked to wake up. The other one is when is actually able to handle the, the fetch request. So the difference between them is basically what the boot up time of the awakening time of a service worker is now, depending upon the value. Uh, how our users are reacting to a fully cached service worker and uh, and and also on the fact that um depending upon the, the cache misses and everything that we have monitored in the in the reporting plugin that we have this is what is going to give us some feedback as to whether we should implement into implement um into navigation preload it depends on two things one is that we have a good understanding of our users code base our users device uh, uh, performance, whether it takes, which, which tells us how long usually usually it takes the service worker to boot up, and the second thing is how much of cash misses do we have? So combined with these two is what we are basically going to decide whether navigation preload is important for us or not. Um, now this is what we decided to do, and we decided that no, we'll not do navigation preloads. But what, what about the what about the issues that are associated with it? Now one of the most important things that we have to understand for us is that. Um, keeping the user always up to date with respect to access control is very, very important. We should not allow uh, any user to see a page that they are not supposed to, right? And that is why we had two levels of access control, both for the you, you, uh, the navigational request as well as the API request. Now, because the navigational requests are being served from the cache, we have to do something to ensure that those cache requests or navigational requests are still live or still intact. So if you go to the next slide, um, so the syncing of the uh, role based access control is actually quite, quite important for us where because of the fact that the navigational requests are being served from whether it's navigation or uh, API requests are still being served from the cache syncing of the RBACs are quite, quite important for us. Now, all of this is happening because the navigation request came from the cache. So we wanted to ensure that even if we are giving a faster experience to the user, we are also not compromising on the correctness of the experience. And the way we do it is by having a high priority preload API request, not just static request, but a preload API request that goes instantly as the as the HTML get, gets passed. So once the API uh, HTML is passed, it actually makes an API call, which is a preload request. And that preload request, of course, if it if the service worker is still not there, it will just go on to the network. But if it is, then the service worker does intercept it, but it lets it go. And um, it basically comes back saying that the user is trying to access this page from the cache. Is the user allowed still allowed to view this page or not? If the user is, then everything is fine. But if not, then we basically clear out all the caches and we basically ask the user to refresh. And we clear up the sessions as well. So the way we maintain the RBACs is through this, which is uh, that we give a faster experience. At the same time, we also ensure that the correctness is not compromised. So that is why we do a high high perform high priority preload API call that gives me whether the current um, endpoint, the current URL access, is still maintained. Now, one very important thing is that uh, all of this is happening because a navigational request came from the cache. 
um we just want to ensure that the request this uh, this uh, preload request is actually coming from a served html that was actually served from the cache right so if your served html was not served from the cache there is no point making this request at all because you just came from the network if your if your shell was served from the network there is no point making this uh, this uh, access control request because you just came from the network you want to make this request if the shell from which this request came from was served from the cache uh, it's a bit pedantic um, just to get into that pedanticity of this particular implementation the problem statement we wanted to solve was um, can you detect if the shell from which this request came from was served from the cache or not and that is exactly how we do a small addition to our computation in the service worker if we go to the next slide is that we basically check the transfer size and if the transfer size is uh, zero it basically came from the cache and because of cache control headers we ensure that this api is not cached anywhere in between in the http caches or in the proxies so if a transfer size is zero it clearly meant from the fact that the url from which this api was made it actually was it was actually put it is actually put or served from the cache so transfer size is a good um proxy that we can use to decide whether this particular thing was uh, you know you know uh, served from the cache or not but it could mean a lot of things it could mean a http cache as well so it depends upon your implementation but in our implementation because we control those access control headers that's why we are able to use uh, transfer size so yeah so what did we do here so what we decided was we will say no to navigation preload because our caches are uh, our shells are 100% cached uh, but at the same time you also wanted to ensure that the correctness is not compromised so that is why we make a high priority api preload request which will just look at the rbac which will just look at the role based access control next slide please the last portion that is remaining for us is uh, pre caching um so pre caching is a bit of a challenge for us because um, most of these applications do not work without login credentials and uh, so while the first time the user tries to um, uh, you know uh, uh, use the application the user in a, you are in a logged out state um, so it is very difficult for us to preload any of our shells because most of our shells will not respond uh, if you are not logged in so from the server itself you will get a 302 to the login page if you are not logged in so it is very difficult for us to pre cache uh, anything in the service worker uh, we have one option of pre caching which is post login uh, which is that depending upon who you are uh, we might want to preload uh, pre preload uh, sorry pre cache certain um, uh, certain other shells that you might be you know interested in or you have access in um, the uh, only concern is that access controls change with time so it is not fair to assume something that you'll have access to two days from now and that is exactly the reason why our investment into pre-caching has not been that much uh, our first requests are always limited are always dependent on network but after that all the requests are always served from the cache um next slide please cool so um yep yeah, and here we are um the last point um which is uh, as part of my talk is uh, the api feeling um so Again, uh, so PWAs have always had this idea that, you know, we're going to give a native like experience. Um, but unfortunately, unlike, you know, content, uh, you know, like uh, uh, how people see it, um, slapping a service worker does not help here. Uh, and it will require the investment from the developers as well to understand and give that experience to the user. So that that is basically what we have been doing. And we have been ensuring that whether you're opening it from uh, the URL or whether you're opening it from the installed version, it should give you a good native like experience. So what we had to look into was things like just as if we could just play the video. Um, so what we have been in, you know, focusing on is, um, you know, like whether it is any, any such uh, um, user control, um, you know, like look, if you look at gesture handling and everything, that is basically how native apps behave where they actually be, where, where they give you a lot of control over the gestures whether it is page to page navigations we have uh, fade in fade outs for the page navigations and all of that and that is exactly what we wanted to focus as a part of the experience part um, because we really wanted to ensure that uh, we are able to provide that native rich experience to the user even when they are actually on a web app and it is possible and the idea is to take away is that it is possible and uh, that's something that is one of our key investment when it comes to building the PWA. Uh, next slide, please. 
so i'm just at the end of my talk and uh, it could have been could not have been possible without uh, my team and uh, pavitra and noel have been working diligently very hard uh, with this particular project and uh, so uh, you know thank you folks for uh, the effort that you have put in and uh, yeah i think uh, next slide i think we are done so